Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. I'm Heidi Boyle, the Director of Education for Intellis Worldwide, and I'll be your moderator today. I'll share some housekeeping notes while everyone is getting logged in. If you have any technical issues, please submit them in the chat, and our partners at M3 will help you. Intellis has many online year-round resources accessible through our member resources tab at intellis.org, one of them being webinars like these. You can watch 20 plus videos from Intellis and nine BHBIA webinars on demand at a virtual learning center. We have saved time at the, question, at the end for questions and you can submit them as they arise in the Q&A se section of the control panel. We do have a lot of people that are gonna be on today's webinar, so we will try to get through all of those questions and if we can't, we will be sending out a full report afterward to participants with all the questions as well as the recording and the slides. <clears throat> Many of you have seen the statement that we released on Wednesday, March 25th, referencing data that shows healthcare providers across specialty still want to participate in market research. Some of this data came from an ongoing study conducted by M3 Global Research. Since that statement was released, the response rate has gone, grown dramatically. Allow me to introduce our speakers who will share insights from that data collected from over 31,000 healthcare providers across the world, including USA, Canada, Europe, and Asia. They will go through the latest findings and explain what you need to know to move your research practice forward. Anton Richter is the CEO of M3 Global Research. He's an industry veteran with over 20 years of healthcare market research experience. He is passionate about driving initiatives to raise standards in the industry with a strong focus on quality at every touch point. He is an avid cricket fan and is currently self-isolating in London along with his wife, Leticia, his son, Alexander, his leopard, Gecko, Caesar, and two new kittens, Pumpkin and Pie. He apologizes in, any, in advance for any disruptions they may be causing. Hannah Brown is the research <clears throat> report author and has held numerous positions across M3 divisions centered around community insights. She is the driving force behind the thought leadership initiatives at M3 and is the proud mother of six-year-old twin girls. She is surviving lockdown by hiding in her garden office, making excessive use of her Peloton bike, and finding elaborate ways to block YouTube on all devices. I'd like to thank them for their leadership on this initiative so that we can share this important data with you. Anton, if you're ready, please take it away. Many thanks for, for that kind introduction, um, Heidi. Much appreciated. Um, and a warm welcome uh, to everyone to this Intellis webinar on market research feasibility during the COVID-19 pandemic. The key interest in this area is very self-evident in the huge number of registrations we've received for this event. Uh, it's close to 800 now. Um, so let's hope the technology holds up over the next 30 minutes or so. I'm sure it will. Um, but irrespective, there will of course be a recording available afterwards on both the Intellis and Ed3 websites. Um, the format of this webinar will be quite straightforward. Uh, Hannah and I will be talking you through some primary research for about 20 minutes or so. Um, and then we'll have a Q&A at the end. Um, as Heidi mentioned, you should be able to ask questions through the webinar software, but if you have any issues, I'm sure she won't mind a direct email. And then whatever we can't answer directly today, uh, we will of course do our best to follow up via email afterwards. Before we begin though, I think it's only appropriate that we acknowledge the incredible job healthcare workers are doing across the globe and their professionalism and dedication in such adversity is truly inspirational. Our thoughts and prayers go out to all who are affected and we all hope for better days, I know. It's fair to say there is a huge amount of concern in the healthcare market research vertical at the moment as to how our industry will react to this developing crisis. Will pharma delay, cancel or postpone research? Will healthcare professionals themselves be able to participate? And most importantly, is it even appropriate that we are still contacting them at this time? So against this backdrop of very valid concern, as the largest provider of global healthcare fieldwork, uh, we felt it important to give our community a voice and let our doctors guide us into how we should be operating in this new environment. So leading then with a, a data-driven approach, uh, we can assure that we do no harm and at the same time answer the very important questions needed for our industry. It's worth flagging at this point the strong coordination and unity we are seeing across associations from Intellis to the BHBIA and Ephemera 
and how all the membership companies have all fed into these events in an effort to provide an informative, consolidated and unified approach during unprecedented times. As such, we've conducted some internal primary market research with a short, not intrusive, five minute online survey. And we're very pleased to say we've had an overwhelming response with over 31,000 healthcare professionals wanting their individual voices on this matter to be heard. As you can see, we have strong geographical distribution across a number of key markets, which include a broad spectrum of specialties who were all randomly sampled. And I think the only thing to add as well is um, at the bottom of the flagship of the other, which is just over 6,000 respondents, that sample um, is made up of just over 1,300 in Latin America, um, just under 2,000 in Australia and New Zealand, and then um, also uh, Russia, Central Europe and the Nordics. And our severe thanks, of course, to um, our partner networks for including their sample with this. So with the research objectives and the methodology clear, um, let's take a look at the actual data. Looking first at the percentage of healthcare professionals willing to participate in healthcare market research, we see a resounding call to action in that 97% of those surveys wish to continue. A hugely positive and reassuring response, which I hope will settle any early nerves. It's important, of course, to acknowledge that this is a response from healthcare professionals who are not MR averse, in that they're on our panel. But there can be little doubt that any negative trends in the healthcare community, given such a significant sample, would have come through in our data, and they simply haven't. There is clearly not a groundswell against market research at this time. In fact, the complete opposite. A few key points then around this data, which are worth highlighting. The sample includes over 20% of those considered to be in frontline specialties, including nursing. There is a significant percentage of the healthcare community not yet involved in crisis management. And as such, they do have some time on their hands. We can see one in four UK healthcare professionals self-isolating at home, some with mild symptoms. And over a third of US healthcare professionals had yet to see a COVID-19 patient. It's worth noting though, that there are some specialties outside of those directly treating patients that are busier than usual, given actually their patients are now considered higher risk. So there are some complexities to contact that will need consideration. And in of Japan, course, sorry, Hannah, in Japan, <laughs> which is one of the key outliers, there is a notable decrease compared to other markets. It's still a very promising 67%, but outside of the usual cultural considerations for the market, the M3 Japan community compromises around 70% of the entire universe. So as such, it's a much broader view into the healthcare community. Over to you, Hannah. Oh, thanks. Um, of course, normal reasons for participation apply. Um, doctors want to stay current, particularly when they're not doing clinical work at the moment. Um, and the cancelled clinic um, element that Anton touched on before, you know, that some doctors have more time on their hands at the moment. That also plays into incentives. Um, obviously, as an industry, you know, we're very keen to uh, play down the importance of incentives to participation. Uh, but at the moment it is playing a part. And the other side of it is that we, we do have a um, social and moral obligation at the moment. There's been lots of talk about ethics of market research, but there's a social and moral obligation to continue research and development into non-COVID um, areas. The same um, treatments and developments that were being considered a couple of months ago will still continue to be relevant and important in a post-COVID world. Thank you, Hannah. So taking a look now at specific methodologies, we will first look at online. Um, here, unsurprisingly, given both the previous slides data and of course the sample community, uh, the response rate was emphatic. 96% yeah, willing to participate. 
looking at frontline specialties alone, it was 96.4% approval. And for nurses, 98.6. So very strong. There wasn't too much market variation, as you can see. Japan was the only real outlier, but at 63%, yeah, it's still a strong majority given the universe approach to sampling I've explained. As a general comment, we have seen remarkably little impact on response rates, which is a very positive sign. They are robustly stable. We even saw a surge in mid-March across Italy in certain therapy areas, which were up by 26%. There are though, peaks and troughs to response rates. And last week saw some decline in a few EU markets, which we've highlighted here in the slides. But I think it's important to point out that all these peaks and troughs are within typical parameters for these swings, which we see on a monthly and weekly basis. Hannah. Uh, the other benefit, of course, of online surveys and this methodology in particular is that this is the one that fits into their schedule the easiest. Um, you know, especially with um, increased digitization of um, invitations, of emails, of dashboards with surveys that are available to them. This is research on demand. So one of the messages that came through in this research was that you know, let us manage our inboxes, let us manage our time. If we're not at work, then we have time available to do this. And this is the most flexible, the, mo the easiest way that to fit into their schedule. Um, and that's particularly important. Thanks. So moving on to now phone methodologies, uh, it's important to preface these results with a key statistic that 30% of the panel typically participates in qual research as a personal preference. As such, when you review these results with an average close to 50% for willingness to participate via telephone, this is a clear statement of intent and a willingness to engage. As always, cultural differences are reflected in participation rates with qual even in normal times. So some of the lower rates which we can see here are to be expected in some of the Asian markets. Of course, phone is a more sensitive and personal method of contact compared to email. And thus it will be considered by some to be more contentious in this current climate. But the data makes it very clear that healthcare professionals are happy to participate with this methodology. And we will run through some very practical tips in this regard later in the presentation. I think that, I mean, we've called out there on the right hand side, um, just under 15,000 of respondents are happy to do TDIs at the moment. So clearly demonstrates that this is a methodology open for business. Um, and yeah, as Anton said, in the practical applications, we'll discuss some of the, um, some of the ways that we can leverage this. So taking a look now at what lengths of interview for healthcare professionals will be found appropriate at the current time. Uh, the trends in the main reflected engagement with qual and phone overall. Uh, so we are seeing lower lengths for Asian markets, reflecting less personal appetite for phone, and those are in line with some of the cultural preferences which we do see. Mm. The US though, um, and EU markets, are much more willing uh, to participate at longer interview lengths, uh, with 78% in the US willing to do longer than 30 minutes, and most of Europe in the 60 and 70% for the same length. I mean, I think, Hannah, you had one statistic come through where someone said as long as they take, didn't they? Yeah, 12 hours. <laughs> A little bit excessive. <laughs> and the other thing as well to remember is that when you look at the, um, the slide here with the participation, there's the dips in China, India and Korea particularly. And you see those um, mimicked in the LOI data. So, you know, when willingness is lower, that has an implication on the LOI as well. So you should be looking co to curtail the length of the interview when you know the appetite for the methodology is lower. Thanks, Hannah. So then finishing up with face-to-face -face research, um, this is of course the most impacted of methodologies with social distancing and local government restrictions firmly in place. Uh, that said, 29% stated willingness to participate 
which given this methodology has a much lower prevalence preference than let's say online quants or phone TDIs, this is still quite a positive data set. As we have seen though with telephone based research, Asian markets willingness is generally lower than those of Western countries, with Germany leading the way at 40%. Perhaps this could be a reflection of their confidence in crisis management and their ICU capacity, which we've seen repeated in our weekly COVID-19 reporting. Restrictions on in-person though, which do look like they will be with us in the short term, allow us the opportunity to pivot and explore creative online qual technologies outside of simply replicating existing research with remote qual. So it will be very interesting to see as an industry how we can adapt and bring value to this methodology with the current restrictions in place. I think it's important to note as well that as we pivot to these remote methodologies, um, we need to make sure that we make use of the full suite of tools. Um, so thinking about minimizing phone contact, being as flexible as possible with scheduling, and really um, leveraging those online tools. So online scheduling and screeners, yeah, you know, we talked with the online methodology about it being on demand and easily accessible that HTTPs can complete at their convenience. The same applies for lots of elements of these remote methodologies. So what's next? Let's take a look then at some practical advice on how we can keep our businesses moving forward without putting unnecessary and inappropriate pressure on our healthcare workforce at a very difficult time. As we have seen, willingness to participate does not necessarily mean that it's appropriate. So firstly, uh, a caution on low incidence studies. At a time when every hour is precious, it's important that we as an industry reward engagement and we don't spurn these well-meant contact points. So I encourage all of you to be very careful in your screening criteria up front, and don't look then to relax this down the line based on performance or field difficulties, but to do so from the start. It's therefore very important that you are profiling your sample as accurately as you possibly can. We don't want to be wasting any engagement by looking for a needle in a haystack. And let's embrace technology and get creative in how we can deploy it so that we are adapting and innovating to keep driving delivery forward. When we look at qual methodologies, there are a lot of very practical steps that can be taken to be more time efficient and to keep contact away from the phone until the actual interview. So for example, programming all screeners online, ensuring that the scheduling is completed online, and then looking at push notifications for confirmations, etc. There's a whole host of things which we can do to take pressure from the phone and keep it just for the interview. Consider therefore what methodology is most appropriate for the therapy area you are trying to research based on the known pandemic impact. It's worth considering here the impact on, for example, patient records. If online access to these charts is gonna be limited for certain doctors, how can we pivot and adapt and still deliver the insight required? This area will certainly need more thought, that's for sure. Generally speaking, online is the safest and least obtrusive data collection methodology, but phone or video-based methodologies are perfectly fine if targeted correctly and deployed sensitively. We should though, as Hannah has mentioned previously, look to limit length where possible and make sure we focus necessary questions. And while online may be generally safe, that doesn't mean we should not be extremely careful and considerate in our contact. Our recommendation here is to have a daily digest to eligible respondents, thus concentrating all available survey invites into a single email and thus allowing them the choice of survey rather than multiple invite invites. A key recommendation is to try and stay away from any cold calling, especially through hospital switchboards, which we know is critical. Unless, of course, they are certain they have not been impacted. Phone-based contact, in our view, should in the main be with respondents 
who there is a proven relationship with. And this is, in our view, the safest way to ensure we do no harm. As a practical step, for list match studies, rather than custom recruitment to complete required samples, why not seek out other providers and thus avoid cold calling? With partnership, delivery can still be maintained and sensitivity ensured. Um, so it's a good time for all of us to be working together on solutions. And there's a last point then on some practical applications here. We really should be focusing on quality in all that we do, because now more than ever, we owe it to our healthcare professionals to make sure that they experience a first-class product and experience when engaging with market research. So from well-designed questionnaires to thoroughly well-checked surveys, let's keep quality top of mind and avoid any unnecessary recontacts or technical issues. As a final point here, we need to work heavily on considerate language to ensure that we have transparent appreciation for their engagement, and of course, ensure that no pressure or obligation is felt or conveyed in our invites. So moving on then, conclusions. We have seen an overwhelmingly positive response to the question of whether market research is appropriate or even feasible in this new world where we find ourselves. And we should take strong comfort that that voice comes directly from the healthcare professionals impacted. We can be led by this data. Even with such strong engagement though, we do have a moral obligation to ensure that what we do is no harm. And we need to ensure that sensitivity and appropriateness are built into survey design at every step and at an early stage. The situation is going to remain incredibly fluid over the coming weeks and months. And as such, forward planning and close engagement with your fieldwork partner will ensure that as feasibility does change, you have the latest information so that informed decisions can be made. And of course, that much needed research can still be delivered. Due to that changing picture, as another very practical measure, we have developed an online real-time global dashboard that will track feasibility and appropriateness across all markets, specialties and methodologies. So as circumstances change, we can ensure that what we do is both respectful and continues to do no harm, whilst maintaining delivery for our clients and completing very valuable research. So lastly, whilst we know we're in for a difficult few months, I challenge all of you to ensure that the market research industry that emerges into the post-COVID-19 world, which it most assuredly will, is one that has learned new skills, innovated new technologies and approaches, and improved not only each other, but our industry as a whole. If our legacy from this most difficult time is one of improvement, increased value and unity, then in some small way, the very real sacrifices being made will at least have had some deeper meaning. My sincere thanks for taking the time to listen to our webinar today. And I hope, of course, you found the data both reassuring and informative. We will do our best to keep you updated as the situation develops. And of course, my best wishes for your continued well-being. Next up on Wednesday, Ephemera will be holding a webinar doing a deeper dive into the same topic in the EU markets. And I encourage all of you to attend if possible to listen to further insights on this area. And that concludes the main webinar for now. Um, I will be handing over to my colleague, Hannah, who's been keeping track of all the questions that have been coming in. And we will do our best to answer as many as we can with the time remaining. Over to you now, Hannah. Thanks. Yeah, definitely busy. Definitely lots of questions. So I shall do my very best. Um, as Heidi said at the beginning, um, everything that we don't get to answer or anything that we've missed, um, we'll put together as part of a, um, a report that we'll send out uh, with the uh, recording of the webinar um, and any other materials that are available as well. 
So um, first question, and it was remiss of me not to um, include it in the presentation, was around uh, when this was fielded. Uh, so the first wave of data was just, so that was the one that was published. Um, that was the uh, 18th, the 20th of March, and that was the um, EU five countries um, and the US. And then um, at the end of March, so up to the 3rd of April, which was when this data was pulled, um, that was when the global partners got involved. Um, so I mean, interestingly, the data is changing all the time. Um, you, know, you wouldn't expect it to be static. And so one of the things that we've done, and there were questions as well about the specialty breakdown, we couldn't slice it every way for the webinar, obviously. Um, but what we've done is we've built a dashboard that's updated every day. And we've basically kept this in field since. So since this data was pulled on Friday, we've just had, I think, just under 900 um, additional records that will be added in today. Um, and it's an interactive dashboard that's available on our website. So you can manipulate the data by specialty, uh, by country, by um, HCP type. There were questions as well about, um, you know, how many were doctors versus um, other healthcare professionals. So that's um, available for you. Now you can manipulate that. So if you have questions about particular segments of markets, that's the best thing to use. It's in the resources section under COVID-19 on the M3 website. Um, the other question on the methodology was whether um, it was the willingness to participate questions, whether they were just yes, no, or whether they were scaled. They were all yes, no. Um, so very linear um, in terms of the responses. Um, question on uh, tracking data on response metrics. Um, so a question asked whether there'd been, been any change in responses to surveys from before COVID to now. Um, yes, there has, but um, actually it's an increase. So we looked at November to November 2019 to February 2020 um, and then compared that with March 2020 and uh, response rates, email open rates and click-through rates were all up um, slightly but up across the board. Um, and then kind of related to that I suppose um, a question on the response rate for this survey specifically, how I think it asked specifically how many people had ignored it versus uh, participated. So um, the response rate for this one was 20.4%. Uh, it ranged from 16% um, in some markets to 27%. So really good response rate, especially for something that had no incentive. Um, question on um, self-selection of, um, of the sample in terms of um, it relating to the willingness to participate. I mean, self-selection, Anton touched on this, self-selection self is inherent in market research because these are doctors on our panel who have chosen to join the panel and they want to be involved in market research. However, and yeah, Anton did mention this, that if there had been a strong um, kind of feeling among the community that market research wasn't appropriate this time, that would have come out in the responses and we didn't see anything um, to indicate any kind of groundswell uh, against MR at this time. Um, right, oh, I've kind of alluded to this, but um, question on how often we aim to run the survey to keep the industry updated. Obviously it's um, evolving constantly. We've got this um, survey that stayed in field um, and as I said, you can go to the, um, the dashboard and access that information um, as much as you want. The uh, last updated date always appears on, um, on the graphs that it exports, so you can see those on there. Um, what we did with this one, because it was a random sample selection, as Anton alluded to, um, that was important to us to ensure that there wasn't any fatigue, but also um, to give us longevity in terms of wanting to keep it going. Um, it's important to us that we keep a really close eye on what's going on at the moment um, and so you know when we're talking to our clients um, and the information that you can then pass on to um, to your uh, your clients in turn is always as up-to-date and relevant as possible um, oh this one's used an interesting one um, so we're getting pressure from local corporate headquarters that we should not be doing market research in their country how would you respond to that um, I think our advice would be that you can only equip them with data. Um, data is important to our industry and it was um, 
obviously important for us to be data driven in our response to this, um, along with reassurance that any approaches will be proportionate and they'll be sensitive. Um, yeah, Anton talks a lot about that throughout the practical applications section. We know that end clients are obviously concerned about their corporate reputation and any, um, any comeback that, that might happen there. And it's obviously entirely understandable, but everything that we are advocating should reassure them that this is a socially responsible approach. And again, it's data driven, um, it's based on evidence. Um, and I think one of the most interesting questions is what does the future of market research look like? Um, you know, as Anton said at the end of the, uh, his conclusions, the future is very much ours. Um, doctors have shown willingness to engage. Um, we need to work on better approaches and leverage technologies that are available to us. There is a brighter future ahead. Um, we just need to get through a, a difficult time at the moment. I think it's obvious that research is going to change, um, methodologies will evolve um, and things will be different. But the question is whether we can make it change for the better. And I think that's up to each and every one of us uh, to try and tackle that. So that kind of, I don't think there's anything else that I can get to at the moment without sitting here and reading everything and, and going through. Um, question on what are the results for specialty? Um, again, it's in the dashboard and we've covered that. I think the best thing probably with the rest of them is to go through them and um, we'll come back and answer them in a, a, a Q&A type document, if that's okay with you, Heidi? Yes, absolutely. Great. Great questions, everyone. Um, we will be sending out those additional um, questions once we have the webinar recording posted on the Intellis and the M3 website. So we'll be sending out that via email. Um, I also want to note that we are continuing to collect data from various sources throughout the global community, uh, from both the provider, partner, and the per patient perspective. And we'll be sending out ongoing releases as the situation unfolds and the information comes in. We're working on another one right now and that will be sent out this week. Um, if you're interested in getting more involved um, with Intellis by joining a committee, presenting a webinar, or if you just want to give us feedback on information or needed resources, um, you can connect with me at Heidi at Intellis.org. We are here for you. Thank you for your time, and I hope everyone is safe out there. Thank you very much. Thank you.